Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here.
Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. So feel free to connect with your host anytime and ask for prayer. We hope you have a great day.
it all to peace The storm surrounding me Let it break At your name everybody, Pastor Kevin here. Thanks for joining us today. We are in God's Big Story, this series going through the whole arc of the Bible, part 29 today, talking about Nehemiah and his journey. And I'm just going to 
shrink it to a window where he's been building on the wall and and there's resistance that comes. So I've entitled this message, Don't Shrink Back, Lean In, Lean In. And when you get a vision, it's birthed, uh, and it's birthed from a problem. And Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer for the king uh, of Babylon, and he's, he's, uh, he hears a report about his people. Nehemiah is a Jewish man, and he hears a report of the people and the condition of the walls in Jerusalem and how they're torn down and rubble and the parts of the people are ravished and, and just far from God. And he, man, he starts to, he feels this challenge. He feels this, the weight of the people and the city and the problem. And in, in Nehemiah 1, 3, it says, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So he gets this report back and man, it really grips his heart. And, and Nehemiah, who could have easily just kind of went, well, I don't even live near there, 150 miles away, uh, you know, long ways away. And I, I don't have, I, there's nothing I can do, nothing I can do. But he doesn't, he, he starts to pray about it. God works on his heart. He fasts, he prays, he weeps. And he, div- and he, God grips him and says, I want to use you, Nehemiah. I want to use you to go and go back to Jerusalem, go to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. And he saw a problem. See, the vision got birthed because he saw a problem going on. And God then says, I want you to be a part of the solution to the problem. And so for Nehemiah, it was Jerusalem. It was the hearts of the people and the walls. For you and I here in the LC Valley, if you live in in the valley or whatever community or city you live in or region, uh, for us here in the Lewis Clark Valley, uh, I I put up on the screen just just the challenge. In the LC Valley alone, we have 40,000 lost, broken, or far from God people. And um, and that's a large percentage of our population. We got about 62,000 in the little little area right here. 40,000 of those uh, statistically are not a part of a local church. They're not believers in Jesus. And that's a lot of people. In the region, 9 million in the Northwest region. 9 million, 40,000 in our local area, 9 million. So that's a lot of people, that's a challenge. That's a, that's a lot of people far from God who need to hear the good news of the gospel. That, if you go to Winco or Walmart, that'd be like seven out of 10 people uh, walking around, you, you see, don't know Jesus yet. Man, that is, an, awesome challenge and problem that we have a privilege to take the good news to those who don't know him. And so we have it. Nehemiah had it. He created a prayerful plan. He goes to the king. The king gives him access. This is chapters one and, and then leaning into chapter two. And, um, and, and before I go into Nehemiah and what Nehemiah did, and then because as he starts building, we're going to find out he gets resistance. There's resistance because anytime you start to walk into solving problems for God that God gives you and he bursts a vision in you to do, there's resistance. And now at River City, we, God has given us a prayerful vision, a God vision, a God-sized vision. It's a big vision. And, and I put it on the screen for you. It's this, that at, at River City, and by 2030, we, we believe we will do this. We will plant 30 churches, develop 300 leaders, and make thousands of disciples. And, and we believe they're going to multiply. We believe that's just the beginning in this next window till 2030 that God wants us to be a part of doing. We don't believe we're doing it alone. We believe we're doing it partnering with other believers and churches across our community and across our region. We believe there's things that God's orchestrating that we don't even know about yet. We already see some of it. But... This is a great, this is a great vision. This is a challenging vision. This is a faith stretching vision, but we also realize that it doesn't come uh, without any resistance. It doesn't come without any challenges. There will be those challenges. There already has been those challenges. There has been that resistance. And we can learn about this for us as a church family, but also for us individually, as you begin to lean in to what God's called you to, whatever local church you're a part of, if it's River City, this is applicable to you directly, but if it's, no matter where you're at, no matter what community you're in, no matter where you're at in the world, God has purpose and plan for you, and the enemy doesn't like it, especially when you start to put action to it, when you start to sow in prayer, when you start to sow in serving, when you start to sow financially and you're stepping into what God's called you to, not passively, but actively, 
that's intimidating to the enemy. And so look at Nehemiah. Let's go back to Nehemiah 2, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and the horsemen with me. When Sambalat the, the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite officially heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem and he goes to the leaders and he submits the letters from the king, basically saying he's given me access and permission to be here. I've got access to the resources and supplies, but I want to talk to you as the leaders of Jerusalem. This is what's in my heart, what God has put in my heart. Well, the, the, the people around, the, the spiritual enemies, if you will, they're, they're, the people who didn't want to see Jerusalem be healthy and the people to be healthy, they get word, they're deeply disturbed, they're frustrated, they heard what was going on and they're like, who is this guy? Who, wh what's going on? What's happening? There's actually something happening? There's somebody who thinks they can make a difference? Because for, for about 150 years, there had been attempts to rebuild the wall. There had been attempts that failed. Uh, you know, so it wasn't the first time someone come in and done something like this or attempts have been made. But Nehemiah, uh, he's got a God vision. He's got a God vision and he's got the backing of the king and favor. Verse 12 says this, Nehemiah, I slipped I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. So he hasn't really, he hasn't told anybody at this point in, in Jerusalem what's, what's happening. He, he's met with the leaders. He's beginning the process and he's on the ground now. He'd made a plan, but now he's in the city. He's like looking at the actual rubble. He had never been there before. It's the first time he was ever to Jerusalem because he's a cupbearer. He's a slave to the king. And, uh, and so he inspects the wall. He assesses the situation. He puts his plan together. And in verse 17 of chapter two, he says, but now I said to them, you know very well to these leaders, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. I just imagine Nehemiah got up in front of those leaders and with a confidence, he's like, men, women, listen, this is what's, what God's going to do. Let's, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. He, he just is bringing awareness to what is already, they already know, what's already happened, but they were, it's easy to be numb to the rubble in your own life, uh, sometimes it takes a wake-up call. That's what I believe Nehemiah is doing. It's a wake-up call to the leaders. And, um, and he's like, guys, we got to do something. God is going to do something. Let's end this disgrace. Verse 18, and I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me. So then he shares the story. His conversation with the king, the plan, the, the favor. And, and then their reply to it was this, yes, yes. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. And it says, so they began the good work. They began the good work. I, I want you to pay attention to those two words there, good work. And that word especially good. And this is in, in God's economy and in, in the Hebrew, this word here is tov, which means this good work was to fulfill the purpose for which it was created. And in the Hebrew, that, that's, that's like, so it's, it's not, it's the same word in Hebrew used back in Genesis when God is making, making the world and creating the sun and the moon and the stars. And he says, it is good. It is tov. It is, this is the very thing of which will fulfill the purpose for which it was created. Like this is good. So in our words, I'd say this is not just only good, it's great. It's fantastic. And so this is what Nehemiah is saying. And, and the, men, the, the gathering of the leaders there, they're saying, let's rebuild the wall. Let's do it. Let's start this good work. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's do it. And I just, the rally was incredible. And so my first point is this. Don't shrink back because God's mission is good, great, if you will, work. It's good work. It's God's work. It's good work, you guys. It's so worth doing. And, 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 and what do I mean by his mission? Well, the great... 
the great commandment, the great commission, right? The great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, the great commission, right? Jesus has given all authority, go and make disciples of all the nations from where you live all the way out to the rest of the world. This is what we're called to engage in, loving and making disciples, developing leaders, planting churches, helping lost people come back home to the God who created them in a relationship with him, salvation, forgiveness. This is the good news. And, and remember for us at River City, we, we're, we're gonna, we believe God specifically said, by 2030, plant 30 churches, develop 300 leaders, and make thousands of disciples. And would, when we do all this in 2 Corinthians 4.15, I love what it says. It says, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. Ah! Oh, I love it. There's going to be great thanksgiving, and God's going to receive more and more glory. We want to fill the earth with God's glory. And as we uh, let the good news of the gospel out through us, through his people, his, his ambassadors, our, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. And as people come to know Christ, the kingdom is expanded, and God's glory is filling the earth. So let's go back to Nehemiah, Nehemiah 2, 19 to 20. So when Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked? So the, <laughs> they're, getting, they're trying to get him to question, what are, you, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? What's going on? You can't do this. This, that's, this, is, this is weird. And so the enemy's trying to discourage and distract Nehemiah and the other leaders. Get, getting them to question God's vision. And, 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 and look at Nehemiah's reply. And let's see what we can learn. He says, in verse 20, I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We are his servants. His servants will start rebuilding this wall, but you have no share or legal right or historic claim in Jerusalem. Ah, uh, I just, I just love it. I love Nehemiah just going, Listen, you don't have any right. You don't share in this. You don't have any legal right to this. You don't have a, any historic claim in Jerusalem. And, and so lean into this. When the enemy tries to whisper lies and sow discord and sow mistruth and half-truth, listen, ask God to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see it quickly so you can go, wait a minute, that's a distraction. That's a lie. I will not take it. And the enemy loves to taunt us. And, and I'm not saying that you say, hey, I'm strong with the, in a prideful way. I can do this. I'll do it my way. No, 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 no. Because the Holy Spirit's in us and God says in our weakness even, he is strong. When we admit we need help, we need strength. When we cry out to him, listen, the enemy has no ground. He only has ground in your life if you give it to him through sin and through believing a lie and through no 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 listen we can stand firm and that's what nehemiah is doing he's standing firm i love it so he's saying to the team arise let's build let's go let's go and in chapters two and three this massive unity, massive work on the wall is happening and they're making progress and he's, he's rallied the leaders and the families and, and they're split up around different divisions around the walls and it's incredible what's happening that this kind of uh, unity hadn't happened in years, decades. And then in, I'm just fast forwarding to chapter four, one to five. San Ballot was very angry when he learned they were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the uh, Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Do you see the mocking and kind of the, oh geez, Tobiah, verse three, Tobiah the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked, yeah, that stone wall would collapse even if a little fox walked along the top of it. So they're, they're, they're doing everything they can to mock and make fun of and go, this is stupid. You guys are being stupid. You can't do this. You tried this before. This won't work. Even a little, this a little, you know, 
light little animal walked up on that stone wall, it'd fall over, it's built so poorly. And see, that is classic enemy talk. That's classic lies that he tempts us to believe. He sows these stinking thoughts, right? That's why we're supposed to take them captive to the obedience of Christ and go, wait a minute, God told me to do this. This is his mission. Just because there's resistance and intimidation doesn't mean we have to give into that. And, and so Nehemiah's response to this in verse four is awesome. But here's my next point. Don't shrink back. Why? Do what? Respond with gut, honest prayer. When the intimidation comes or the mocking comes or the, the discouragement starts to creep in, respond with gut, honest prayer. I lo- look at Nehemiah's response. It's interesting. It's good that he prays, but look how, he re- look how he prays. He says, then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. <laughs> So, it's not really funny, but it's kind of funny. And what I guess I loved about it, I loved about his response, Nehemiah's response here, is that he's gut honest. It, it, he, I don't think he wasn't really praying for the good of the enemy, uh, of the enemies of, of, of the people. Um, but he's basically saying, God, take care of them and heap back, up on, heap back on them the things they're trying to pour on us. Don't ignore their guilt. Don't blot out their sins. So I don't see a lot of grace in this prayer, but you got to admit it's gut honest. It might even be a little bit of a mean prayer, <laughs> like wipe them out. But see, here's what I love about it and why I love that it's here in the Bible. You and I, listen, God loves it when we're gut honest in our prayers. Be gut honest. And, and Rather than just ignore it, rather than shrink back, don't shrink back. Take that, take your frustration, take even your anger towards the enemy's response to God in prayer and be honest about it. And trust that he'll pour, as you pour out your heart to him, he'll steer and guide you even in your attitudes. Because <laughs> maybe you need to pray, God, would you help them see you? Would you help them see you and, and quit intimidating us? And that, help them see you, help them recognize where they're being controlled by the, the enemy of their souls, right? So. He isn't, he, Nehemiah isn't there yet. He's just frustrated that they're trying to frustrate God's work, which you got to appreciate that, which is good. But be gut honest in your prayer, all right? Now, um, the enemy's tactics, remember, are to get us to quit, to shut down, to shrink back, to go passive, to get us distracted. And there's been so much progress, it makes sense that the enemy is intimidated. Now, verse 6 says this, It says, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm, worked with enthusiasm in the new, in the NLT. And then in the new King James, I like how it says it. So we built a wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Ah, I love this. And see, and, 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 and I guess here's my next point with this is that don't shrink back because unity really intimidates the enemy. See the unity that was happening, and and this is, in the end, this it only takes 52 days to complete the wall, the rebuilding of the wall. Something that they'd attempted for 150 years didn't get done. Nehemiah, inspired by God, with a God vision, with unity, with a plan, with unity of the people, rallies and gets this thing done in 52 days. Well. They're at half, halfway done here, and it's freaking the people, the enemies of the Jewish people out big time, the enemies of God. And they're like, I can't believe this. I can't believe there's so much progress. And, and I love that it says that we built the wall and there was a mind to work. They work with enthusiasm. There was energy. There was focus. There was collaboration. And that's just the opposite of that is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to spread us out. He wants to isolate. He wants us to be infighting and not working together. When we're unified and unified around a God vision, listen, we got to expect there's going to be resistance. First of all, in your own personal life, expect there'll be resistance, but don't let it shrink you back. Don't let it shrink you back. You guys work together, unified, and you'll be amazed what God can do. Sometimes the greatest spiritual warfare we can do is to keep doing God's work, to keep steady, to keep at it. 
to not shrink back, to just take one more step, one more step, to prayerfully take a step and, and acknowledge your need, acknowledge, talk to some others, get some prayer going on, lean in, don't do it alone, don't do it isolated, do it unified. And momentum starts to happen, and it's this momentum that's happening here in Nehemiah that's and on the wall, half its height, that's intimidating so much. Now listen, last night I was, I was up at uh, Genesee at our dinner church uh, that we really got fully launched this, this just recently in this last semester. And it's so awesome. We had a, probably 65 people there, and it just went great. The people, the connections, the community came out. It's a small community. That's a great turnout for that size of community. Had so many, met so many cool people, interesting conversations, great food, a good 10 minute Jesus story, worship was happening. It was beautiful, you guys. God's presence was there. And listen, that intimidates the enemy. When we're loving on a community, when we're sharing the gospel and the good news of Jesus, and we're planting seeds and we're watering seeds. But I love the, the team that was there, unified, heart to bless and serve and give. It just communicates the love of Jesus so clearly. And so it was so fun. And I, and I love seeing that momentum even in our DNA groups, our discipleship groups that are happening. That we Because we, we believe God's called us to make disciples and it's happening organically, but we've got some specific groups that are diving in and, and learning how to share their faith and learning how to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. The conversations are happening. People are getting saved. They are getting discipled and they're starting to see, wait a minute, I'm called to do this too. And they're doing Doing it. So let's go back because look at verse 7 of, of Nehemiah 4 here. It says this, it says, when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead, that their intimidation wasn't working and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. <laughs> so they made all these plans to come and fight. The enemies did uh, and throw us into confusion. That's a classic enemy tactic. Throw confusion. Get the, get, try to stop the unity and the synergy and the partnering together. And it says, and, but we prayed. What did they do? They prayed to our God and they guarded the city. So they prayed and they stood watch. All right. And so here's my next thought. Don't shrink back. Take responsibility. Take responsibility, take responsibility to pray, to serve, and to give, to pray, to serve, and to give. Don't shrink back. It doesn't say they, that they, they um, it doesn't say that they attacked, the, the, the enemy attacked, but he was postured to. They were, but they were watchful. They were, they, were, they were not acting like something might not happen. God was giving them wisdom to pray into it, yes, and to also stand guard, to be ready to fight if they needed to. And so that was what was being postured in. But the enemy at this point was just intimidating. He was just waving big arms. And, and listen, you and I's responsibility is to take responsibility. God's given us a part. Don't go passive. Go active. How do you activate? You pray into it. Yes. You serve. You, you, you bless. You be, you be fruitful and multiply. You bless others. We're, called to, we're blessed to be a blessing. And when you do that, and part of that is with your finances, you give, you, you give to your local church, you, you sow into the kingdom work. And, and, and sometimes God will ask you to give sacrificially, not just tithes, not just a few offerings here and there, but maybe he'll ask you to give even more than that. You need to talk to him about that. Be spirit led in your giving. And, and if you're not giving anything, start, start somewhere. Really just start to sow even financially. If you, if, and if that internally right now feels resist, resistant to that, ask God about it. Right? I ask God about it because I find that the people who part of, well, part of discipleship is recognizing you are a steward of everything. You're, you're a steward. You're a manager of everything God's put in your hands. Part of that is your finances that he's entrusted to you, your job, your family, your kids, all of it, your talents, all of it. But a real practical thing is your finances. Maybe you need to learn how to manage and budget the finances he's given you better. Maybe part of that is giving. Is, is sowing financially. And I'm just telling you, you start to grow in this. I know from personal experience, you start to do this, you start to be let generosity flow through you financially, God will bless you for it. He will. You'll be a blessing to others, but he'll grow you, he'll stretch you. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing. 
And so in a season where, uh, where things are being stretched financially in your life, it's a great question to say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And watch and see what he does. He'll take you. He keeps growing us, all of us, all the time. Now, the enemy's been trying to intimidate. He's bringing, trying to bring confusion. And look what happens. Nehemiah, he responds. He doesn't panic. He responds courageously. Not, he doesn't respond to fear. He's practical. He's got wisdom. And he courageously leads here. Look what he does in verse 13. He says this, So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and, and my point here is, I, I guess just look at that on the screen. Just remember the Lord who is great and glorious. So he's, he's not saying guys, we should really shrink back. No, no, no. He's saying, remember God. Remember who's our strength. Remember who fights for us. Remember who gives us wisdom and gives us strength and and will allow us victory here. Look at what's already happened. We're over halfway there. Guys, he used you. He used us together. We did it. God did it. He gave us the strength. And so now we need to fight for each other. We need to help each other in this process. If your families and your homes, remember this is something God's given you to steward. Steward this. Steward your space, your family, the wall, the city. Don't let the enemy have any more victory. Come on. Lean in. Don't shrink back. And so next point, don't shrink back. Lean in together. He doesn't say lean in alone. He says lean in together. And that's what's happening. You're seeing all this unity happen. Look at verse 16. For from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding. Then our God will fight for us. I love verse 20. Then our God will fight for us. But he, he, look how practical it is. He's like, so at, at first, everybody was working on the wall. Then he divided, he had a strategy, then divided them up. Let's let half, half guarding, have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, and, and then half building, half putting on the mortar and half watching, right? Ah, I love the strategy. And, and sometimes, without question, God requires us and asks us to be adaptable and to be flexible in the process, not to be rigid in the strategy, because God will lead us and guide us. And it was really practical. He did that here, and they did it together. They leaned in together. They said, we're not going to be intimidated and shrink back and just stop the building of the wall. No, 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 no. We're going to re- regroup, refocus. We're going to pray about it. And the strategy comes. Half of you guard, half of you build. And then rotate, rotate, right? Incredible. So in, in our world, it, you know, many of us aren't building physical walls right now. Um, and, and that's not where the battle is. But in your life, when you feel the resistance of the enemy, how do you lean in together? It's, it could be as practical as texting somebody when you're struggling, when you're feeling resistance, when you're feeling discouraged, when you're feeling intimidated, text them and say, would you pray for me? It could be that. And when you get a nudge about somebody else, text them and say, hey, how can I pray for you? What's happening? If you know someone's going through a tough season or a difficulty, a sickness, a, you know, something, or maybe they're financially struggling re- or their kids are struggling, reach out to them. How can I pray for you? Or I am praying for you. Let me know if there's anything specific more. Yeah, just that kind of unit, as we do that in our groups, our life groups, our, our Valley Girls tables, our, our, in the youth group, everything we do, as we do that together, we lean in together. We hold each other up. We guard each other's backs, right? That unity really matters. Now, keep going, because, and actually, this, this unity, I mean, it's just, that investment in each other is so valuable, so incredible. And God will get his vision done through his people. And we will get momentum as we unify. But also recognize, let me lean in, also recognize that one of the things he wants to do is create discord and disunity, right? So when you're tempted to be judgmental towards others, when you're tempted to um, uh, get frustrated with somebody because maybe they don't see things the way you see them, or you, you have a different political perspective than they do, and you're not willing to listen, you're just like, well, I can't believe that 
I can't believe they believe that I'm out. Remember, your brothers and sisters in Christ are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you may not agree on everything, but try to seek to understand each other, listen to each other, pray for each other. Rather than judge somebody and write them off, lean in, connect with them, talk with them, hear their heart, hear where they're at, knowing that God is the one who brings transformation and change in all of our lives. Nobody's doing this perfect, this life perfectly, and we need to help each other. And remember that part of the tactic of the enemy is to get us disunified. So don't, don't gossip. And, and if you're tempted to gossip, rather than say something about somebody else that you know, pray for them, pray for them. Take that gossip and turn it to prayer and intercession. Yeah, especially if you're tempted to be critical. Quit, ask God to help you not be critical and say, God, help me to pray. Yeah, this is, this is huge. This is big. And, and there's so many things around unity we could talk about. But remember, God wants us to do it not alone, but together. And if we fast forward to chapter 6, and it's the end of the story in so many ways. It says this, the wall is finished. It says, so on October 2nd, the wall is finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. God did it through people, unified, through his people, unified together, working together, fighting together, uh, resisting together, praying together, physically building together, the vision got accomplished. There was a problem, broken down walls, and that wall being completed then began to give freedom for the hearts of the people to get softened. And then God began to work on the hearts of the people as well. And they just had a major victory together. This is huge. And so here's my last thought. Don't shrink back. God is fighting and helping us. He's fighting for us and he's helping us and he's believing with us. He knows what he wants to do, but he gets it done through his people. That's his choice. And he wants to help you be able to resist, but he wants you to come to him and he wants you to ask him and he wants you to talk to him and he wants to birth vision in you. And, and, and you know, for us at River City, I said on the front end of this message that God has called us, we believe by 2030 to do this. It's a big vision, plant 30 churches, dinner churches, micro churches, different expressions of church, right? We just believe it's about getting the gospel out and seeing kingdom, kingdom expanded. And we wanna do that in partnership with many others and many other churches, and we are excited. It is happening. Currently, we have the refuge in Walla Walla. We have Numa in Spokane. Uh, we have dinner churches that are all done collaboratively, multiple uh, believers and churches working together with our, with our dinner churches. We have the bridge in Clarkston that's, that's rocking every week, Lapway Dinner Church that's, that's going wonderfully uh, in, in, in Lapway and Genesee Dinner Church this year that we're doing regularly. Last night, as I mentioned to you, we had about 65 people there. It was just, it's fun. The atmosphere was wonderful. The connections and the fellowship was great and lots of new friends friends, new connections. And then God willing, this fall, fall 24, we're, we're going to launch the G Street Dinner Church in, at the Lewiston Community Center. And that is our heart. We've already have several churches who are ready to partner uh, with a few more on the way. And we just are believing God to continue to reach people that don't know him, to do some things we haven't been doing in different ways to reach people we haven't been reaching. And it's happening. And, and it's, uh, you know, uh, also a couple more things that are in the works in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, we're going to plant a micro church and a kids and family with a kids and family focus in the spring of 25 that's TJ and Crystal Weary that's their heart God's called them to it we believe that is going to happen in the spring that's our target we trust God with the exact timing and then in a Soton uh, we believe a micro church will be planted and uh, Josh and Michelle Lester are going to plant that so we're we're believing with them for the right timing of that but I, we're, we're targeting the fall of 24 so you can see that there's movement and Pomeroy is on the list for a dinner church we believe God wants to do. So he's been doing some stuff there the last few years. We're asking him for wisdom and how do we collaborate with other believers. God, what are you up to and what do you want to do? What's the right timing for that? There's others in the works, but these are just a few of what God's doing. It, it is fun. The vision is happening and that problem of of 40,000 in the valley and 9 million in the Northwest region. We believe God's called us to do that, to focus on that. That's a big area, that's a lot, but we trust him with the timing and the partnerships and all the plans. And uh, leaders, we believe God's called us to develop leaders. We were up to almost 50 leaders that have been through leader track as a beginning of their leadership development. And, uh, and discipleship. I mentioned the eight DNA groups that we have going, and we got a training coming up here in July.
apply and, and a series on discipleship uh, in this compelled to go series that we're going to be doing. And we're just really believing that God's multiplying. It's starting, you know, it's starting, it's happening, it's going, we're in progress. We trust that God's leading us by his spirit. Ah, it's so exciting, you guys. But we also recognize that there will be resistance. But we aren't going to shrink back. We're not going to shrink back. We're, we're going to lean in. Because you know what Ephesians 3.20 says? Look at it. 20-21 to 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Holy Spirit's in us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Imagine, imagine what can happen in your life, your personal family, as well as in your church family. If you and I look to the God who can do all things, he can do immeasurably more than we ask or think. I can ask pretty big, you can ask pretty big, but he can do more than that. He, it's, it's abundant, it's, he's a God of abundance and he is interested in reaching people with the good news and being a blessing to you, yes, and through you. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share your heart and, and to see what Nehemiah did when resistance came. Lord, I pray for us, Lord, anybody here that's, that's feeling that resistance, that discouragement, Lord, would you lift it off? Would you get them? Would you help them to reach out to somebody? Lord, as I pray for them, Lord, I pray that, that they would feel a difference tangibly. They would feel a, a lifting, uh, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And, um, and Lord, would you, would you stir vision? Lord, would you help people lean in and not shrink back? Lord, if they've been shrinking back, I pray they, they'd say, God, help me, and they'd come back up and into alignment with what you're doing. Lord, if, if someone's caught in sin, would you help them to repent right now? And Lord, just lean in and say, God, forgive me. I turn and get my eyes back on you, and I'm going after all you have. In Jesus' name. If you don't know him, if you don't know Jesus, just say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. I give you my life. Thank you for your love for me, your grace for me, your forgiveness for me. Thank you for paying a price for me that I couldn't pay myself. I give you my life today, Jesus. Be the Lord and master of everything in my life. Amen. Amen. Love you. Have a great week. We are grateful for the Word of God and thrilled that you joined us today. We hope you experience God's presence and will continue to experience Him throughout this week. If this is your first time checking out RCC Online, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus and want to know more about walking with him, please text RCC Life to 97000. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Have a great week.